have a, I have now the comedy of survival. As Joe Meeker says, tragedy seems to have been an invention of Western culture only, most interesting, specifically of the Greeks. As he says, the, the intellectual presuppositions that you have to have in place before you can create tragic lit literature have not been present in all civilizations. It's absent, he claims, for example, in Oriental traditions, Middle East, and what Meeker calls primitive cultures. I'll come back to this notion of primitive cultures again. Anyhow, as he says, that the tragic view assumes that, uh, that the human exists in a state of conflict <coughs> with powers that are greater than he is. It has to assume that before it can get off the ground. And, of course, one of those powers that's greater than he is is, guess what? Scarcity. I mean, this is, I'm not laying the scarcity thing on Meeker, but this is one of the powers that's greater than we are, scarcity, because it's fundamental and it's given, all right? And what tragic lit is all about is that the human is equal to or superior to that conflict. The tragic hero is a, what, a triumphant image of what the human can be. And of course that image reaches its absolute zenith in ancient Greece, in the tragic lead, and of course in Renaissance Europe, especially Elizabethan England. And I emphasize Elizabethan England because of A. Shakespeare and B. Francis Bacon, both of whom equally from totally different points of the compass exalt heroic achievement arising out of struggle. Now, so far as I've been able to turn up, then it seems that although the ancients contributed this overwhelmingly important concept of mythic tragic heroism, they didn't have uh, anything to say, really, about competitive economic theory. Their economics were pretty well buried in the greater study of human affairs, and they weren't treated separately. Economics, as an object of study, had to wait for the Renaissance, really. Why, I don't know, but it seemed to wait for the Renaissance, 14th, 16th centuries. The Reformation at the end of that, and then the Enlightenment after that. The, the uh, economic historian George Sewell reminds us that at that point, during that period of time, Renaissance through the Enlightenment, long time, but a point, there emerged, I'm quoting him now, new concepts of science, and scientific method, ideas of individual liberty, freedom of conscience, social and political equality, the substitution of contract based on choice instead of class status, and finally a humanism expressed in hope for better things in this world rather than merely salvation in some other world, and so on and so on. And so on. So we have some identifiable streams emerging, I think. Yes, yes, ladies and gents, it is about competition. We have objective science, we have individualism, we have freedom and equality, social contracts, humanism, and all that. And I'm going to pinpoint just a few of the more important items as I see them. Important both as building blocks of the modern paradigm and as contributing factors to the cultural perspective that supports the modern paradigm. Now, Francis Bacon, bless his heart, was three years older than Shakespeare. He lived a decade longer, so he did a decade more damage than Shakespeare did. It's hard to get your, your mind around, you know, the cultural implication. Imagine living at that time. One year we have Hamlet, and the following year back to back the advancement of learning. The next year, Lear. Just like that, one, two, three. In 1598, we had both the first edition of Bacon's essays and Henry IV, part two. Wow, well, what a time to live, if you were literate. Tragedy, heroism, struggle, eh, in all of it. Striving and achievement, the power and the glory of the human enterprise. No question. Our friend Morris Berman gives a lot of attention, justifiably, to Newton as you well know, but it was Bacon 
after all, he made Newton possible, just as he made possible another tortured soul to whom we were turned, called Charles Darwin. Bacon made them possible by providing the philosophical justification for a person doing science and remaining a good Christian. And that was a tall order indeed in his time. Just a word or two about Francis Bacon, because we haven't addressed him directly, but I know you've read about him in, in the uh, Berman at least. Essentially, Francis Bacon may be seen as the patron saint of the conquest of nature. Because he provided the goal, and then he legitimated the goal philosophically. This is why he's the patron saint. Descartes provided the means. Okay, not the goal, the means. He provided the math, the quantification, the objectification, the dualism. Newton and all the rest provided all the theory, and uncountable others invented the tools as the conquest of nature went along. Bacon was it. Bacon celebrated technology. <coughs> There'd been technology, of course, since some human antecedent first domesticated fire, long before fuel making, first domesticated fire, which is the first technology, I think. But it seems that Bacon was the first, as, as Lee puts it, to elevate the control of environment to a philosophical level. This is a new idea in human thought. The control of environment being raised to a philosophical level. So we have, then, the conquest of nature as an idea as an idea, a new idea. And we also have the conquest of nature as a new imperative. So the conquest of nature, both as an idea and as an imperative, was brilliantly new and original. It had not happened before. Now, Bacon's last book was called The New Atlantis, as you know. It's a technological utopia, is what it is. But in order to sell his ideas in a time when science was viewed with the greatest of suspicion by the church, Bacon had to provide some kind of justifying rationalization, and he did. This is what he did by some extraordinary reasoning worthy of an Aquinas. He contrived the marriage between Christianity and science. Now, his argument is, as it has been distilled by Lee and a number of others, goes like this. When we sinned originally and were turfed out of the garden, we lost two things. First, we lost our moral innocence. And secondly, of course, we lost our garden. But lo and behold, Bacon finds that God provides the master plan outlining the route to recovery. Item A, the recovery of moral innocence, is taken care of by religion. And item B, the regaining of the garden, is taken care of by science and technology. And God wills that it be so. So you have the mastery of nature through science and technology turning out to be the realization of the divine intent, the divine direction. And the rest, as they say, because you know what. The whole project, you see, the beauty of it was that it was so easily secularized at the time of the Renaissance. The whole work, the thing never looked back. And as many have noted at this point, henceforth science meant utility. And utility meant power over nature. Science had not meant utility heretofore. And then enmeshed with the idea of the domination of nature. Science achieved its modern and contemporary role. Man was meant through science to compete with and overcome the forces of nature. God's will be done. Man as what? Man as hero. And who celebrated man the hero? more than Shakespeare and Milton and all their imitators. And this is the way Bacon put it, this is what he said. 
only let the human race recover that right over nature which belongs to it by divine bequest and let power be given it the exercise thereof will be governed by sound reason and true religion Unquote. he describes the objective of the conquest of nature as liberation from I'm quoting the inconveniences of man's estate the inconveniences of man's estate meaning as Lee and others have pointed out meaning literally the satisfaction of human wants those inconveniences can be translated as wants so here we have a large part of the package do we not struggle achievement liberation etc no priest could take issue with any of it and most wonderfully no merchant could take issue with any part of it either it was perfect <coughs> after all nature has no uh, intrinsic or inherent interest in any philosophical sense there's no interest in hearing in nature but the human does have a divinely conferred interest indeed a moral responsibility by this point to master nature in the human interest which turns after all out to be the divine interest eventually of course it transcended Christianity altogether but in the late renaissance it required and used Christianity to kick it off now almost simultaneously with this there were emerging in other quarters the, the early mutterings I would say instead of murmurings mutterings of individualism the year before Bacon passed away the Dutch philosopher Grotius published the law of war and peace that was 1625 thereabouts which was all about guess what the inalienable and indestructible rights of the individual we hear so much about rights do we not in the newspapers these rights were and still are in some quarters of some original elemental natural sort most interesting indeed this is right back in 1625 we're reading about on the front page of the globe this morning some original elemental natural sort of rights human activities through history had just obscured them because we didn't know what we were doing but they were there all the time now if you read that with Bacon together with Bacon this would seem to confer the right of dominance over nature not only on the broad sweep of humankind as a species but we're bringing it down to the individual human level each of you as an individual has the right to dominate nature as well as our species does very important now, there was a lot of talk in the mid 17th about as you well recall the natural state there was of course Hobbes and his Leviathan and all that with a lot of emphasis on natural freedom natural self-sufficiency independence there was also a good deal of combat and competition you'll recall for Hobbes that is for Bacon reason is the covenant that binds together human societies reason is it because without reason we are poor and nasty and brutish and it's through reason and I know I'm repeating myself but I'm trying to fill in the background it's through reason and reasonable logic that the human transcends uh, our natural proclivities for bloody mayhem reason produces the social contract that allows us to well, continue the peaceful pursuit of science and of technology and of the conquest of nature competition then is natural but only for animals on this view cooperation is the human invention in this view where informed and have been all our lives natural rights of life and liberty and natural rights of property don't forget we're enunciated by Locke the property territoriality were enunciated by Locke in anticipation of the of course of the American Declaration of, of Independence that declaration also making good of Rousseau, making use of Rousseau's original good and all of that original freedom and original equality all those things it's interesting that in the American story we have the meshing then of Bacon and Locke and Rousseau 
and as George Grant has said, the American supremacy is identified with the belief that questions of human good are to be solved by technology. But the most important human activity is the pursuit of those sciences which issue in the conquest of human and non-human nature, unquote, George Grant. Jefferson uh, asserts those same inalienable rights, doesn't he, of Grotius, 150 years later, that in the purest Baconian sense ha had been bestowed by nature and nature's God, nature and nature's God, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we're going to have property rights, and we do now have property rights and territoriality being being uh, discussed in terms of the Canadian Constitution, other constitutions. The right of proprietorship. Eh? Anyway, by the time of the American Revolution, the modern system of nature, and now we'll come back to nature, had already been set in place by the Swedish naturalist, the von Linné, who, to give himself respectability, Latinized his name into Linnaeus, so it would match his system. His name was Van Linné. Now, in precisely the same way that Aristotle had, Linnaeus saw every species of plant and animal as forever fixed and forever unchanging, each on a specific place, each standing on a specific link in what is often called the great chain of being. Like Hobbes, you remember the great chain of being, everything in its place and everything in its place, and a place for everything, and immutable and unchanging. Like Hobbes, like Locke and the others, Linnaeus believed in what was then called the eternal natural state, to which he added the concept of place or station, but his place or station being in a, in a hierarchy of rank and immutable and unchangeable. Okay. An early statement, is it not, of niche, of what we're still being fed in the ecology in terms of niche theory and an early implication of the natural economy. I trust you've all read worst here. I'm going to start referring to him now. An early statement of the natural economy. So we had going on simultaneously Rousseau's natural humanism and Linnaeus's clinical systematizing of the organic word world by a keyword, as it were. So while nature is being given an orderly hierarchical arrangement by keyword, the emphasis on man was of the dignity of the individual and the autonomy of the individual simultaneously, you see, together with this whole array of natural rights which you inhere in natural man. Bizarre when you look at it on a dissecting table. In the same year as the American Declaration of Independence, Adam Smith, of course, added to the picture of natural man, our famous innate propensity to barter and trade, which he alone among the animals exhibits. But I don't think anybody would quarrel with that, that we alone exhibit that. Commercial competition, however, was part of natural man in the Rousseauian sense. When the individual operates in the marketplace, you'll remember, in the purest Hobbesian sense, he's functioning in his individual self-interest. Important. But Smith says, as he seeks his personal ends, he's led by, you know what, an invisible hand to promote an end which is no part of his intention. So individual self-seeking competition turns out to be to the benefit of the greater enterprise, to the benefit of all. It all can be done within the social contract. Extraordinary stuff that's rationalizing. It all down inside the social contract. Smith says, the obvious and simple system of natural liberty establishes itself of its own accord. <coughs> so there's something elemental about it. And finally, he notes the uh, absolute necessity of free competition as a condition, as a precondition of his system of natural liberty. Finally, the bottom line, good management, says Adam Smith, can only result from that, I'm quoting, free and universal competition which forces everyone to have recourse to it for the sake of self-defense. And boy, do we have a mixture of naturalism and mysticism 
in that statement. Now, I don't know whether Charles Darwin ever read Adam Smith. I don't know that. But I do know that he read to his everlasting <coughs> prophet, Thomas Malthus. Worcester, you'll recall, says that it was good old clergyman Malthus who really turned economics dismal. <laughs> it's interesting that even today, Malthus, incidentally Malthus meaning Malthouse, meaning brewer, that's what it means, don't say Malthus, Malthouse. Malthus is still bad at a pessimist today, when I think all he did was call them as he saw them. I think that's all he was doing, was being a reasonable, fair-minded umpire. Very simply, food increases arithmetically, population increases geometrically, and I'm fascinated by this statement being seen as pessimism. Think about the implications of being able to see that flat statement as pessimism. I find that utterly fascinating. Still is, of course. Don't forget that Malthus was a clergyman and a nice man. And he was, uh, I think, more deeply concerned about the human condition than most others of his time. But he was an honest man and a simple one. And uh, he thought that he would devote himself for a change to problem definition. So perhaps solutions would follow. He was simply trying to identify the problem. I think this is why some contemporary eco-philosophers are also called pessimists and misfits. You know why society doesn't like problem definition, ladies and gents? It doesn't like it. Malthus did offer one or two solutions, but first he summed up his case in this way. He said, I think I may fairly make two postulates, he said. First, that food is necessary to the existence of man. Secondly, that the passion between the sexes is necessary and will remain nearly in its present form. Uh, unquote. Well, he was on pretty safe grounds there. But what about the exponential nature of population growth? and the relative slowness of the arithmetical growth of food. Well, traditionally we had the four horsemen of the apocalypse, didn't we? We had the, what were they, famine and pestilence and war and death, and the horsemen too. Famine, pestilence, war, three of them. I forget. Anyway, would these four horsemen be uh, sufficient in future? Malthus wondered. Well, the kindly man that he was, he, he thought that... <coughs> He thought that human free will should be able to do a little bit better than should be throw us upon the mercy of the apocalypse. So he advocated prudence and self-restraint in sexual matters. Well, that was hard. He advocated late marriage. That was good. Which would be good for the character, as he had in any case. And no family should have more children than it could support. Ideally, too. Now, there might have to be harsh retribution, however suggested for those who spawned more offspring than they could support or than the state should support should so his bottom line was when things get to the pressure point and charity and public support should not be extended to those who could not support themselves the poor will simply have to take care of themselves or else or else what? Or else the apocalypse will, that's all. And we've always had the apocalypse to take care of these things. So it's the, clearly it's the duty of the upper classes to properly instruct the masses about the population food ratio. Well, Mondes didn't know anything about modern biological theory having to do with you know, internal <coughs> population regulation in species and in populations. But in a very real way, that's what he was talking about, wasn't it? He was also talking about natural selection, although, of course, he didn't know about that either. That hadn't yet been invented. Now, that book of his, incidentally, was first published in 1798, so we know where we are historically. And it was, there were later editions, as there always were in those days, and expansions and that. But it first came out right at the turn of the century. So obviously, Malthus had to be in the mainstream of uh, individualistic competitive thought, didn't he? He simply put the Hobbes's, Hobbesian formula a little more grimly, I guess, than uh, 
than most people did, but he was essentially saying the same things. Certainly the struggle for existence at the individual level, the individual struggle for existence is obviously at the core. But at the same time, there's another stream in European thinking, especially in German literary philosophic circles, which we, I guess we call it romantic now. It was about a community of souls, a kind of organic whole kind of thing we're accustomed to reading about on posters and, and liberated press in 1988. Baltus had a contemporary, a guy called Adam Miller, who even, as an economist, was big on mutual inter interdependence and big on the wholeness of life, which was, as I say, popular at that time. This had implications for the state, of course, which could swing one way or another, I guess, depending on who was doing the swinging, but I won't get into that. Merlet was an old-fashioned romantic idealist. His work was further developed by one Friedrich Liszt. One of his ideas has relevance here, and I'm quoting him. The power of a community to produce wealth was not a mere matter of individual self-seeking, but an organic, or as some would say, a cultural situation favorable to production. Well, now, if you take that one and substitute something less pejorative for wealth and production, then I think we have quite an appealing statement on the possibility of community transcending individual, and a very modern eco-philosophic concept it would be. Adam Miller, same time as Mao, turn of the 18th century, turn of the 19th century. In the early, uh, mid and early 19th century, however, this, uh, that particular notion of wholeness and community and that was going absolutely nowhere because that's not where, they, where the thrust was in those days. What was going somewhere was this kind of stuff as expressed in a, you may have read, by the French botanist de Candel in 1820. And he said, Toutes les plantes d'un pays, toutes celles d'un lieu donné, sont dans un état de guerre. All the plants of the country, all those of a given place, are in a state of war. Was it? This was more like it. This was what the time demanded, what the economistic thinking of the time required. A generation later, a gener full generation later, Darwin used the identical words, even without being so merciful as to recast them, he used the identical words. Thanks to Linnaeus, however, until De Candel came up with this warring metaphor, we'd had for a hundred years the ancient, the ancient, the, uh, the classic picture of the great chain of being, the fixed and unchanging world, a place for everything, everything in its place. But De Candel added war, so this made it the great chain more difficult to to uh, cope with because that activity within it no longer fixed and immutable, maybe. I think it was uh, Isaac Newton who, in a quite uncharacteristic way, uh, declared that he'd stood on the shoulders of giants. Modesty didn't become him, but that's what he said. That he stood on the shoulders of giants. There was to be one more giant, of course, of a naturalist philosopher before Darwin. That was no. Those days he was surpassing all round naturalists. They all were in those days. As Worcester says, he virtually overturned the sacred Linnaeus all by himself did Charles Lyell. So when, uh, when Charles Darwin was tooling around on the Beagle around the world, he carried with him these two volumes, great chiefly volumes of Lyell's Principles of Geology, which had been published two or three years before in 1832. And here are some of the items that Darwin, the young and impressionable 25-year-old Darwin, was reading as he uh, pondered these strange fossil beds that he saw down in Patagonia, weird beds of fossils down there, <coughs> and all these strange lava flows in the Galapagos and all that. First, we have a straight in Lyle, unabashed statement in English of the continuing struggle for existence, Lyle's words, which prevails in nature. Lyle especially was struck in, and noted the competition between two individuals for the same resources of space or food, and later mates. And he introduced also, did Lyle, the idea of competition between species, which was brand new. 
No such competition, Lyle believed, was fierce and was violent. How else, he thought, could you interpret these twisted, weird fossil remains that were beginning to be discovered in those days of monsters long since eradicated from the earth? God had dealt with these terrible monsters, fierce and violent in the past. They were just beginning, you see, to be seen just then. Most important of all, maybe, from Darwin's viewpoint, young and impressionable as he was, was that Lyle rejected the uh, cataclysmic theory or catastrophic theory of evolution that prevailed at that point. Remember, there were theories of evolution before Darwin. They were catastrophic and cataclysmic. We may be returning to some of these now. Something told Lyle, he couldn't prove it, but something told him that evolution was not explosive and cataclysmic, but gradual and continuing. And that was the major thing that he contributed to the young and impressive Darwin. <coughs> so now we have Darwin. We read this stuff of Charles Lyell's, which is all, believe me, revolutionary at that time, at that time in philosophy science. Reading this stuff of Lyell together with Malthus and his uh, contribution, together with his own observations of Darwin, that was all he needed. Now I'm not going to review Darwinian biology because the agenda here is competition, anyhow. Just a few of his comments in this matter and some related matters. But I want you to understand how he came by it. It was the conventional sociocultural wisdom of the time. Chapter 3 of The Origin is titled, not an original title, Struggle for Existence. <coughs> Struggle for Existence, which he stole from Lyle. And he starts with reference to Dukandal, who I just talked about, and Lyle who says, these are Darwin's words, have largely, De Kendall and Lyle, have largely and philosophically shown that all orga organic beings are exposed to severe competition, unquote. By philosophically, he meant theoretically shown. He, Darwin, would furnish the evidence, okay, the empirical evidence. He emphasizes that this struggle for life, as he calls it, must be he says, thoroughly ingrained in the mind. In other words, he's beating the reader over the head with a baseball bat at this point. It must be thoroughly ingrained in the mind, because if we don't bear it constantly in mind, says Charles Darwin, <coughs> the whole economy of nature, with every fact on distribution, rarity, abundance, extinction, and variation, will be dimly seen or quite misunderstood. In other words, you won't be able to understand his grand thesis unless you accept as given, without any evidence, the concept of competition. Please remember this. In other words, if you don't accept Lyle's competitive struggle as fact, then the next 428 pages of his thesis aren't going to do you, dear reader, much good. And he says it. He says it on page 62 of the original to which I returned quite recently. He is careful to say this. He says, I do use the term struggle for existence in a large and metaphorical sense, including dependence of one being on another, and including, which is more important, not only the life of the individual, but success in leave, leaving progeny. Well, that's okay. He notes that the struggle almost invariably will be most severe between individuals of the same species. And as new forms emerge, each new variety, these are his words, each new variety or species during the progress of its formation will generally press hardest on its nearest kindred and tend to exterminate them. Straight, hardcore Thomas Maltus. Okay. Nothing, nothing's any wrong with it. I'm saying it's hardcore Thomas Maltus anyway, where it came from. Note, however, this is more important for my purposes here this morning, the use of the word progress in the formation of new species. Vitally important. Absolutely and fundamentally important for all of Western thought. Because what it does is reify and celebrate and animate, guess what? Aristotle's great chain of being. All over again. Hierarchical. Uh, hierarchical rating, this is more important than the one under it. That's all it means. Darwin, his 
Yeah. I'm coming. I'll oh, just now give you the evidence. Okay. He animated the great chain of being, so you see, because Aristotle had every one in the chain was more important and had more eminence than the new act from below it. Ergo, in Darwin's view of evolution, if it had evolved in this hierarchy, let's say clearly the one at the top is is a development of progress over that which lies below. Okay. Fundamental in Western thought. So fundamental that we don't even understand that it is a belief. That's what I meant by the power and weight of the, uh, of the cultural tradition. Now, as time goes on, Darwin says, species that are rare for some reason or another, or whatever reason, will be, these are his words, less quickly modified or improved within any given period. And they will consequently, Kim, be beaten in the race for life by the modified descendants of the commoner species. Progress, improvement, competition toward winning, he says it outright. He illustrates this by way of domestic animals. He likes to talk about domestic animals. Showing how new breeds replace older and inferior kinds, his words. If it's newer, it's better. That's taking me modern thought. This was to be of overwhelmingly uh, importance later on, of course, when the humanists were going to eventually have to swallow the fact of organic evolution. They had to. It was there. Progress and improvement made it tolerable to swallow by the humanist community. If we could see our species as being a progress and an improvement of what went before, then said your average all-purpose humanist, it's okay with me. Without progress and improvement, Darwinian theory might not have entered Western mainstream of thought when it did. But I don't think he was consciously doing this as pap for the establishment. I don't think he was. He wasn't like that. Because he was a good Christian and he believed it. He wasn't doing playing any games. He believed every word of what he wrote, I think. He put it more forcefully later on in subsequent Later on in, the, in his book, he says this for you, Kim, and I'm quoting. More recent forms must, on my theory, be higher than the more ancient. Good Aristotelian statement. For each new species is formed by having had some advantage in the struggle for life over other and preceding forms. I do not doubt that this process of improvement has affected the more recent and victorious forms of life, his words, in comparison with the ancient and beaten forms. First edition of The Origin of Species. Well, there it is, engraved on stone for all time. That takes care of that part. The rest we know about. The marketplace, <coughs> the marketplace construction of the world was never more pervasive than it is now. And it permeates, of course, more than biology and more than economics. Uh, I think it permeates the entire Western worldview. But especially, uh, regrettably, to say, regrettable to have to say it, especially in its an American form, its American rugged individualistic form, the Teddy Roosevelt form. Uh, I want to go briefly now to a few alternative human experiences. Actually, the biologists and the economists in the chambers of commerce, all in a lump. I would lump the biologists with the chambers of commerce, pretty much. What want to see competition as a fact of all of human life. They must, in order to maintain their worldview, don't, don't misunderstand. They must be able to see competition as a fact of all of life, including human life not merely of our Western most highly evolved society, but all life, then are the, we, as the pinnacle of organic evolution, were natural after all. Think of those wretched hunter-gatherers eh, uh, out there in the bush somewhere, scraping away at the dirt or scraping away at each other's throats. Remember the, the definition of scarcity 
as being characteristic of the human condition. And a competition for scarce resources is that which makes the world turn. And that's what it's boiled down to. Remember also social dominance, eh? And male chauvinist primatology and all that, male dominant hierarchy stuff, all those kinds of things. Now this stuff in the late 50s and through the 60s was largely pervaded by a fellow called Sherwood Washburn who had a colleague called Ir Irvin DeVore and a long list of their disciples. You still see them on recycled stuff on TV Zero once in a while. This was the uh, alpha male uh, killer eight group. This is what these were. We're indebted to Washburn, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of it, not only for the image of male-dominated status competitive primate societies, but we're also indebted to the same man for man the bloodthirsty aggressor. Because guess what? This is in the 50s, after all, early 60s. Washburn could not distinguish between aggression and predation. So because we meet, we're aggressive, honest to God. And this in our own lifetime. So Washburn says that we have a carnivorous psychology, which means that we enjoy killing and cruelty. Now, anybody who's read any Paul Shepard or any of my stuff or Neil's, for that matter, will know that there are other points of view about, about our psychology. Eric Fromm, for example, has thrown some interesting light here. As he says, the, cons the conclusion could be, instead of that we're uh, these killer, killer beings, the conclusion could be that we're not competitive, that modern man has an innate impulse for cooperation and sharing, rather than for killing and cruelty. Why not, says Fromm. Unfortunately, the uh, human record of cooperation and sharing is a bit spotty as the history of civilization shows. <coughs> but you might explain this, <coughs> uh, speculates Fromm, by the fact that <coughs> the impulses for sharing and for cooperation have become deeply repressed in cultures whose organizations discourage these virtues and instead encourage an exalted ruthless egotism. Well, I could use that as my summary statement, but I'll continue. I mean, there it is. I mean, that's a beautiful statement of the exaltation of competitive egotism. And Fromm cites an anthropologist, some of you may know more, will know more about this stuff than I do, called Colin Turnbull, who I gather is a luminary, but I don't know anything about anthropology. <coughs> this man studied, <coughs> excuse me, two hunting societies in very considerable depth some years ago. And he reported among these tiny societies an almost total lack of aggression, emotional or physical. And this is borne out by the lack of warfare, feuding, witchcraft, and sorcery. Remember Adam Smith on man and his innate propensity to barter and trade. An anthropologist by the name of Service, one ER Service, comments on this, I'm quoting, Says we're accustomed to think that human beings have Smith's natural propensity to truck and barter, and that economic relations among individuals or groups are characterized by economizing, we tend to think that, by maximizing the result of effort, by selling deer and buying cheap. Service says primitive people do none of these things, so-called primitive. And he also notes that social relations among the members of hunting gathering society are characterized by the absence of what is generally called dominance. So it ain't universal. As Fromm says, there's no peck order based on physical dominance at all, nor is there any superior, inferior ordering hierarchy. Service observes that in hunter gatherer societies, there's no leader or head man in the sense usually associated with uh, the word chief that we customarily use. Fromm says, this lack of hierarchy and chiefs is all the more noteworthy because it's a widely accepted cliché that such control institutions as are to be found in virtually all civilized societies 
are based on a genetic inheritance from the animal kingdom. There's evidence around for the prosthesis, in other words. Marshall Salins in 1968, and know him if you don't know him, torpedoed the economic notion of universal scarcity as having any relevance whatever in hunting and gathering societies. Zero. You'll find uh, Salins in both his own work and in Lease and Fromm, especially this one. Scarcity is the peculiar obsession of a business economy that it has absolutely nothing whatever to do with subsistence hunting. As Fromm says, quoting him now, prehistoric hunters and agriculturists had no opportunity to develop a passionate striving for property or envy of the haves because there was no private property to hold on to and no important economic differences to cause envy. On the contrary, he says, their way of life was conducive to the development of cooperation and peaceful living. Well, I disagree uh, with the point about the agriculturalists. They did have property, I think, and a concept of it. And of course, hunting and gathering, I think, did not give rise to cooperation and peaceful living, as Fromm suggests, but I think rather perpetuated it. It was already there in our biology, in our genes. And hunting and gathering didn't fly in the face of it. They just used it. Cooperation and peaceful living already there. Fromm is too much of a humanist to acknowledge that it was in our biology, that's all. Boy, he says, I agree with it. Property, after all, is what? It's symbolic, it's not real. Property is a piece of paper, something written on it. Cash is symbolic. Clearly. The scarcity, when it occurs, then, is not of tangibles, after all, is it? When it does occur, the scarcity is of the symbols to fill the prosthetic void. It's scarcity of pieces of paper, not scarcity of absolutes. Fromm goes on to analyze 30 so-called primitive, I hate that word, but forgive him for a while, because they're contemporary after all. Why do they have God call these things primitive? They're living in the same century we are, in the same decade, why? Call it primitive, I don't understand that. Well, I do understand it, of course, but make the point. He goes on to analyze 30 so-called primitive cultures. Now, this is interesting from the standpoint of aggressiveness versus peacefulness. Those are his words. I suggest you read that. It's in the anatomy of human destructiveness. Um, I do wish that the dear old thing had known more, or did, does know more about biology and about animal behavior, because he's such a total innocent in those fields that it affects his work. But uh, of the rest, his intuition uh, in the anthropological context are perfectly wonderful, I think. The anatomy of human destructiveness, Eric. From a couple of features in this study of all these so-called primitive societies, there was a clear. There were thirty odd. There was a clear <coughs> correlation, an undeniable correlation, between the presence of private property and the presence of competition. Absolutemente correlated, and correlated too between competition and hierarchy. And also, interestingly enough, between competition and magic. This is worth some thought. Between competition and magic, always present hand in hand in each case with competition. There was private property, there was a hierarchy, and there was magic. His conclusion was that, I'm quoting him now, the instinctivistic interpretation of human destructiveness is not tenable. Destructiveness is neither innate nor a part of human nature, and is not common to all men. At the root of human destructiveness, where it does occur, he says, is some mix of competition, proprietorship, and hierarchy, according to Fromm, and according also, of course, to myself, uh, both arriving at it from totally different perspectives. He is a humanist, I is something else. So, destructiveness then is pathological, I would infer from what, uh, from what uh, Fromm says. I would infer also the competition, proprietorship, and hierarchy are pathological also. And that's my conclusive remark on that because primatologists have used the word pathological to describe competition, proprietorship, and hierarchy. 
But what is competition made of? I'm going to leave this issue after this morning, I assure you, but it is so desperately important that we have to spend some time. What is competition made of? I suspect that it's some recipe involving social stress at the root, for sure. Define however you want to define with conceptual ingredients that the stress is real at the bottom, then you add conceptual ingredients like the likes of individualism, progress, perfectibility, independence, and of course the sacred self, the sacred infantile individual. So, see the course does build after all. Finally, Back to my stated thesis uh, that competition is natural only to the extent that it's a pathological condition brought about by stress. There's one very, very important exception to this I'm happy to relate because competition, I assert, is natural and does occur. That is competition of a very special particular kind. And that is in the context of play, which is the Olympics and which is puppies playing and racing and birds and everybody else. All warm-blooded animals at least play. Uh, especially mammals, but birds too. It's not restricted to young animals either, though we used to think so. It simply is not. It's most visible there, that's all, because they tend to stay put in one spot where you can see them. But adults play also. And there's interspecies play as well. Most play involves chasing, racing, wrestling, or catching. All can be seen as competitive. It's not goal-oriented to play, isn't it, in the sense of prize-oriented. seems to be just for its own sake. Clearly, the obvious unintended benefit is exercise. I've often said the name of the game is growing up with young animals. It's not means and ends, in other words. It's spontaneous, it's play. So perhaps I should not use the word competition. I'd like to have a better one. But I can see competition racing. They are racing, indeed. But it isn't goal-oriented or prize-oriented at the other end. It isn't medal-oriented. It's for the spirit of the game. So much for competition. And I won't talk about it too much more, except in context of our domestication and how it's, how it's further developed than that. Okay, you still believe scarcity makes the world go around and competition makes the world go around? Still believe in Darwinian natural, uh, evolution, you know, mono? Still believe in the great chain of being? What do you believe in? Anyhow, that's what I'm trying to find out in your logs. As I've said before, I don't give a hoot if you agree with me, it doesn't make a nice big difference. I want you to address these kind of problems. That's what I want you to think about. I was reading, I have to I confess, I haven't read Charles Darwin. Uh, but I have read Worcester. On the read it is good. The Worcester is a sensational book. Uh, but I read Worcester on yeah. Darwin, and, and uh, there's another side to Darwin, according to Worcester, yeah. uh, uh, which uh, comes out, which he talks about the the recognition of, of uh, mutualism. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But the competition was essential to his model. He couldn't make his model without it. And, and that he himself, as a naturalist, Darwin, is, uh, was very uh, uh, I guess empathetic with other species. Oh, God, yes. He wasn't a, 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 a tyrannical human. He was a wonderful, uh, sensitive naturalist. He sure was. And he never, I don't think he'd better publish the thing at all. You know, he was such a God-fearing Christian that he felt he said that like he was committing murder to entertain these thoughts not even to write them down just to entertain them he felt he, like he was committing murder extraordinary really tortured like Newton very similar but had Alfred Russell Wallace not dropped his bomb on him in the 1830s he might never have written the thing up it's quite conceivable but he written the Beagle Journal but he might never publish his thesis But isn't it interesting how the prevailing socio-cultural economic wisdom of his time has enunciated by Malthus and so many others. In other words, social Darwinism 
preceded Darwin. This is the part that we have to remember. It didn't use Darwin. It used him later, as, as some apologist made use of But so did Darwinism existed before he did. It spawned him. Because he took the socio-cultural, socio-economic model of the time, as enunciated by Malthus and all the others, and applied it to nature. And it worked. And that's what happened. He didn't invent anything. What he invented was its application to natural process. I'm downgrade. Don't misunderstand me. My admiration for it was unbounded. But it can be boiled down to that. His insight was that it applied to nature that was natural. Whether you choose to believe that, believe that or not is your problem. But I don't care about uh, now in our next session about Darwin or Malthus or anybody else. But I do want to hear about uh, about competition in the marketplace, and I want to hear about uh, how these things get set into place and how we act in response to, and how we might act if we did not have to obey the dictatorial requirements of the competitive model that runs our society. And. Ultimately, my only goal in this course, because of its title, is, is it possible for us to perceive nature differently? And on what evidence, or what experiential evidence, or what Who's going to respond to this? Um, Cam and Charles. Do we have a third or two? It would be fine. Who, who hasn't done one yet, by the way? Both Kim and Charles, I know. Huh? Yeah, he'll have to. Yes, you too, Adrian. You're going to have to do one at some point. Uh, is he the only one that's left out, just those three? Well, then we'll recycle you all. Now everybody do two. That's great. Terrific. Charles and Kim, thank you. Anything else? Thanks for attending at 8 in the morning. Let's look at the lovely day we have now left. We can have. Better than starting to ruin the day deeper into the day. <coughs> nine more logs, if you please. I have to, I have to say I had nine. Six more. Six more, if you please. Thanks, Murray. <laughs> I'll try to get them back to next Tuesday. Thank you. We haven't mentioned DNA at all. Should we mention DNA? Mm -hmm. I once went to I once went to a dinner party with Bob Haynes, who's chairman of the biology of Rocky. And you know what he did? He he claimed to be manufacturing DNA on the spot, right? <laughs> what he was doing was reconstituting it. He had a great tin of liquid nitrogen, he had this stuff and waving it around in the air and it was DNA. What do you want to say about DNA? Mm. Or genetic investment. Right back to right back to nature and nurture. We can never escape yeah. it. I mean, we've left that behind. But still. Genetic investment. In modern day situations. In a hierarchical. I'm not uh, following situation. what. I know of no respectable theory that flies in the face of anything I've said yet today that is regarded as being respectable. It's a long, long list of influences and stuff. It sure is. A tremendously long list. So, it, I mean, I, our our warped vision of the world has a legitimate pedigree going back 2,000 years is what we're talking about. And the better we understand it, the better we can deal with it. You bet it goes back 2,000 years and more. Nothing is more fundamental than unchallenged beliefs. That's why I keep going on all the time about zero-order assumption and zero-order humanism. They're so fundamental, it takes a great effort of will as well as of intellect. 
even face up to the there. Truly does. Mike? Um, I was interested in, when you're talking about calm and the study of the 30 primitive cultures, yeah. so um, you mentioned magic. Yeah. Is there, is there a little more, you got a little more information on that? I wish I did. I never bothered to follow it up because it's out of my realm, but things like superstition and magic and mm -hmm. this kind of mm -hmm. stuff were apparently highly evident in those societies that had possessions and competition and propriety. That's all. I just left it at that. I didn't follow it up because I've got enough problems to follow up, but it's there. And you can follow by going to his sources, character and service and front. Look at his book. It's well bibliographed. But it's interesting. It's double, isn't it? I just never followed it up. I don't know. Pardon? No, it wasn't. It's no, it's somebody else that I didn't recognize. Not the one we know, uh, Mary. But it's there, and that's a, that book is readily available. That from is a good one. Bearing in mind the limitations that I already cited, so he knows no biology. What did he Paul, his sorry, first Paul first had his hand up first. Just a really fundamental question. Um, how do we get around this problem of scarcity and stress, the link between scarcity and stress? Is it just that we perceive something to be scarce? Or are there actual scarcities? Yeah. Because obviously it's going to generate a certain amount of stress. Clearly there are periodic scarcities because of the drought and, the, and all that kind of stuff. But the notion of fundamental scarcity is being necessary, what I'm interested in, that the concept of fundamental scarcity is necessary to make the whole theory work. That's the part that dismays me. Not that there isn't scarcity by a time, of course there. So how do we deal with, if there are uh, times of real scarcity, yeah. they're obviously going to influence how we are behaving. Oh yeah, you're going to, when there's real scarcity, real as opposed to genuine, right. then the lion cubs starve. That's what happens. And so uh, that's all that Thomas Malthus was trying to say. In times of real, genuine scarcity, there is stress and there are pathological situations, and they pass, and then things get back to normal again. That's the way I comprehend it, Paul. Sure. These, remember I said, there's no, I don't say a competition doesn't exist, it 